things have been stirring in my heart for a very, very long time. And we did say in the prayer this morning about time. And everything has kind of culminated around this whole aspect of what I want to share. And the um, preachers that we've had on Hebrews have sort of crystallized even more things into my heart. And I remember praying many years back that I, I asked the Lord to show me what does it mean to be loved by you? I mean, it is such an awesome truth. And I wonder how many of us fully comprehend what that actually means for each one of us. I know from my own heart that it's been a journey of progression, a bit of understanding by a bit more of understanding. So I'm going to be talking about the sovereignty of Christ because I feel that that is where everything starts. It starts with him and it ends with him. What I plan to share, by the grace of God, if I don't get all confused with my notes, because, because I don't think I want to read them, is that without him, I have no story. And anyway, what I'm about to relate has nothing to do with me. It really is everything to do with him. It's his story, who he is, what he has done, and why he has done it. So, I have listened, as I said, about this, this Hebrew study, and I asked myself, what does sovereignty really mean? What does it mean to be sovereign? We have sovereigns in the world. They're kings and queens. They've been and they've gone. They've come and they go. And we talk about sovereignty in our nations. This is a sovereign nation, so don't you dare do anything to hurt us and harm us. And there have been wars and lots of other wars. But there is a sovereignty which is way, 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 way beyond all of that. And that is the sovereignty of Christ. And if we can see this, we saw that, we see, we see from John that in the beginning is the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Who was he? Who is this man that the scripture talks about? Who is this Jesus who loves us with a, with a love that is way, 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 way outside of our comprehension? I don't understand it fully. Do you? How do we get to discover who he is? How on earth am I going to know who this man is who has created this phenomenal universe. And I look at it and I think, who am I? In comparison to the universe out there, who am I? That he should deign to love me. I know what I am like. And I look at this and I think, God, how, 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 can, you possibly, how can you possibly come and, and love somebody like me? But the scripture says that he does. The scripture says that he came in order to love us and to restore us. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So... A little while back, you may have remembered that I came up to the front and I said, 
that I really felt that God was saying to me, stop hiding behind your age. Hmm. I don't feel old. I might look it, but I don't feel it. I still feel like a spring chicken. But I ask myself the question, Lord, if this is you saying that to me, why do I do that? Why do I hide behind my age? Am I hiding behind my age? And if I'm really being honest, and I suppose this is a platform for that, <laughs> I have to acknowledge that yes, I have been hiding behind my age. There are a number of reasons for them. I'm not going to tell them all. But I know one of them is simply because it's a heck of a lot more easy to step back and not do anything. I'm surrounded by a church of a lot of very, very young people. <laughs> and that includes Harry, <laughs> Gary. And when I say young, read the word energetic. You people, you youngsters out there, all of you youngsters out there, you're the future. You're the future of the, of the church. I still have a future until God calls me home because you never ever retire in the kingdom of God. And that is so wonderful to know that God has a role for each one of us. And I've looked at many, many leaders and I've sat under the lot of leaders teaching, many of whom have left an imprint of Jesus on my life. What a privilege. What a privilege to know that people can speak and you can hear and you can listen to what they're saying and you absorb what they say and they leave on your heart and on your life an imprint of Jesus. That is such a rich, rich gift. And if you say, well, that's all I've got, that's great. Well, that's all you need, and that's more than great. So, I'm not a lone ranger. And I'm going to start moving forward. And I'm taking a step in faith. So I'm not about to hang up my running boots. So I see this picture and I think, well, Ryan alluded to a grain of sand on the beach and how appropriate. I thought, well, I might as well not bother standing up because he's, <laughs> he said it all. But the scripture in Jeremiah, he quotes and he says, Ah, oh, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Who are we, really? And then I think of what David said. And he says, when I consider the heavens and the work of your fingers and the moon and the stars that you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? So, when we looked at Hebrews, the key word was supremacy and preeminence of Christ over everything. Angels and all the leaders from the past. And according to the Oxford Dictionary, which is one of the ones I like to use, sovereign is supreme and ruler, especially a monarch. So, in biblical terms, I figured that has to have something much more 
deeper, much more meaningful to say to us. I wouldn't dream of telling a queen or a king what they should do or how to go about it any more than we can do that with the Lord. I think sometimes we try. I think there are times when we sort of say, do this, Lord. But who, we, who do we think we're talking to? The potter cannot say to the clay, or rather, the, let me get this right, the pot cannot say to the potter, why did you make me like this? For goodness sake, look at me, I'm a big fat teapot. I would rather be a tall, slim, coffee pot. <laughs> and we don't like coffee in this house. <laughs> or, I've heard it said, talking about the gifts and who we are and what we are in Christ. All of us are different, by the way. I an eye is an important part of the body and it sees. But God actually made you a, a foot. And you think, well, that's not very glamorous. I'm inside a sock and I'm inside a shoe and uh, I want to be seen. So the Lord said, that's fine. From now on, you can see the inside of a sock. So with the gifting in the body of Christ, we're all different. You and I all have individual, unique giftings. Some people are struggling to find their role. Others think, I know exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to touch the world for Christ, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to say this, and I'm going to say a lot of I and I and I involved in this. I remember Derek Prince saying at one stage, you too can have a faith like mine. Uh -uh. No, you can't. I can't have a faith like Father Willem. Why? Because I'm not called into what he is called into. That's not my gifting. We sometimes look at people in the church and we think, wow, that's a powerhouse. I'd love to be like that. Well, maybe. Good idea. Aim for it. But God still says, you are who you are because I've made you who you are. And you have your own very special, unique gifting. And maybe we should sometimes sit down and say, Lord, what is it? What is it that you've called me to do? And it can take a long time. I know from experience. I've, I've had lots of ideas of what I'm going to do. But God says, actually, I'm going to put you aside for a while. I need you to listen to what I have to say. So as I search the word of God, and I go back to where it all started, right at the very beginning, God says, and God spoke. And what he said happened, just like that. Soma, as they say in Afrikaans. Soma happens. <laughs> if I say something like that, will it Soma happen? No. But what that did say to me was that there is power in the spoken word. And what you and I say to one another can have a powerful good or it can have a powerful, not so good. And I can remember at school being teased mercilessly because my English wasn't very good. And I, I learned this phrase that they all kind of said to one another. 
Sticks and stones can break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Actually, that's not true, because they do. So when you realize the power of the spoken word, it is very important to really be aware of what you say to people. You can knock somebody down and flatten them, or you can have the complete opposite effect and raise them up and lift them. I know which one I would prefer to walk in. So we see that the sovereign God is actively involved in everything that he has created out there and in here and in here in each one of our lives. And we see, we saw, we see Jesus coming to reveal the Father. Why? Why did he do that? What, 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 was the, what was the whole object of the exercise? It was to demonstrate that the God <coughs> that he is, who he is was not being demonstrated through the priesthood. He came to show a better way. And this better way was something that caused people to follow him because he was just rather different from everybody else. They rather liked what he said. But more than that, it actually goes woof and hits you there. So being sovereign and as the sovereign God in our lives or in his life actually, he is free to make his own choices. He chooses exactly what he wants who he wants, and why. And in the early part of Acts, the sovereign God also speaks of the, the nature of God. They're, they're praying and they said, sovereign God, um, in Acts, sorry, I'm getting confused here, the nature of God was very different from the sovereign royal households that we deal with today. So, as I look at this, and I'm beginning to get a bit more of a glimpse and understanding, I think, well, okay, now what do I do with all of this? What's, what's it mean? What does it really mean to have a sovereign God who created everything that we see? And all of us. What do I do with that? What am I supposed to, how am I supposed to respond to that? Clearly, head knowledge is not enough. And as I pondered this, I realized that what God was saying, the knowledge that I'm giving you is for a reason. Yes, it is for you to understand and to walk into. But it is also for you to give. You give what you receive. So we have a God who seeks to restore us all, and he has a huge plan of salvation, which was right at the very beginning. So come this very, very brief look on sovereignty. Demonstrate to me on the magnitude of this immense crazy, crazy love of God. And it leads me straight to the centrality of the cross. And that has been, for me, looking at it on a, over quite a period of time, some several months actually, has shown me things which I, I knew and things which I didn't know. <clears throat> the sovereignty of Christ has drawn me, excuse me, <clears throat> to the cross. Jesus, <coughs> excuse me, Jesus fulfilled the law. He didn't come to abolish it, he came to fulfill it. And I'm actually overwhelmed and I'm captivated 
by the love that God has for me. I have been reading a lot of books, one of which is John Stott on the Cross of Christ. It's such a wow book. You can read it and read it and read it, and there's such a wealth of theological truth in that. And I toyed, I toyed with using quite a lot of the book. But the Lord said, uh-uh, this is more about... Oh, bless you. This is more about what I'm doing than in what you're going to read in this book. So we have it, Jesus. He enters into this whole picture, and you think, okay, so now, I don't know about you, but when I became a believer, I... Now let me get back to where I, the Lord showed me something this morning. We come to Christ because of the cross. Christianity is different from all other religions because of the cross. It's just become a symbol. And some people think you're mad. I mean, worshipping a cross. You don't actually worship the cross, but people think we do. We worship the cross. No, we don't. We worship the person who hung on the cross for you and I. And we know that sin results in death. Scripture tells us that. The wages of sin is death. But I look at the cross, and you see the cross there. And you see the cross behind me there. I see the cross there, and to me, I see it starts from the top down, and originates with God, down to earth, to man. And you have this horizontal bar, and Jesus says, this is how much I love you. And then I look at that, and I feel the Lord say to me, and this is how much I want you to reach out and love others. Because as the Lord dropped into my heart this morning, and I was kind of a bit bowled over by this, I thought, that's really cool, Lord. <laughs> that's a word that a lot of people use today, and we did too when we were youngsters. That's cool. That's really cool. Was that love is sacrificial. And what do I mean by that? Paul talks about being crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Okay? That's what the word says, that's fine, but I have always struggled with that. This whole idea of being crucified with Christ. But this morning, it suddenly dawned on me that the importance of love means that you actually love the other person above yourself. You want for the other person more than you want for yourself. So love actually yourself within you, I, dies. The only problem with being a living sacrifice is being living, you can get up off the altar and walk away again. <laughs> but there's a something that happens within each one of us when we are drawn to the cross of Christ by the power of the sovereign Christ. He comes to us and 
you start to get a hunger for who he is and what he is. And you think, I need to know this. I need to know you. So as we come to the cross, we end up becoming born again. So then we realize that the cross actually deals a phenomenal death blow to a lot of things in our lives. I mean, who I am today is not who I was before, not by a long stretch. And that I can say thank you to the Lord for. But it deals a death blow to so many different things. But the important point for me on the forgiving of, of the cross is it starts with your forgiveness. God hung there in order to forgive. Now we pray the Lord's Prayer and we say, forgive me as I forgive others. Do I? Do I actually forgive others in the same way that God forgives me? Because when I say that prayer, I'm actually kind of saying to him, well, if I refuse to do it, then you don't need to forgive me either. Because basically that's what we're saying. But we want it for ourselves, and we're very reluctant to reach it out to others. So forgiveness is a prime, prime starting point. And it deals a death blow to all the lies of the enemy and how many are there that come our way. Did God really die? Did God really say? Do you really have to do without? So we have these, the lust of the eyes, I mean the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. I saw an advert a little while back which brought that to mind. And it was advertising, I think it was a Samsung, new top of the range mobile phone. And the background person saw it and said, I like it. And I want it, and I'm going to get it. Isn't that how it is with so many of us? We like it, we look at it, I see it, I like it, and I want it. Well, when we come to the cross and when Christ lives in us, some of those things kind of take second seat. Some of the time, not all of the time. But I also think about a cross, and when I became a believer, it was very central in my life. But then you become a Christian, and you sort of think, well, I know all this, and you kind of say, okay, well, this is very good, and uh, do you know Jesus, and uh, have you met him? Standing in a post office, and you think, wow, if these people only know Jesus standing amongst them. So you say, okay, well, what are you going to do about it? Um, the cross is there, but you walk away from it. You obviously don't, but I have. I mean, it is just, just there. And then you get on with living life. And it's not that you don't believe, but you're kind of, you're believing, but you're kind of soft, belie soft believing, as I call it. And I, this whole... This whole study of mine, this whole process that I've been going through has shown me something else, that in churches we often see a, st a picture of a st what I call a sterile Christ. Clean, loincloth, thorns on his head, pierced side, hands with nails and feet. But I think many of us have seen Mel Gibson's movie, and it wasn't like that. It wasn't like that. Jesus was actually stripped 
naked, completely stripped naked. He was ripped and pulled apart and battered, and he didn't look anything like we see in the pictures in the churches. So it's good to see a cross without a figure. And that got me thinking some more about how we get to know this, this man who died there for me and for you. And I get stuck a bit on, on Job and the story of Job. He had everything. But he must have been a priest because he sacrificed for his children in case they sinned. And then Satan has a chat with the Lord and says, you know, watch this guy here. He's, of course he praises you. you. You're pretty good to him. And God says, you can do what you like. I'll give you access to him. But you don't touch his life. So Satan has a field day and everything goes wrong in, in Job's life. He loses everything he had. His children die. He's lost all his wealth. And then enter his lovely three friends, Job's comforters. And they're very, very good at explaining to him why he's going through the problems he's going through. Towards the end of the book, we know that actually God says they were talking about things they had no idea about. But what I just love in this story is Eventually, God comes back on the scene and he says, Okay, guys, you've had your, you've had your say, now I'll have, a, I'll have a say too. Where were you, he says to Job, when I laid the foundations of the earth? When I did, and then proceeds to tell him all the things that he did. Job's response ultimately was, I had heard about you, with the hearing of mine ear. But now, my eyes see you. Now, isn't that how it is with us? We heard about God before we came to know God. Knowing about God is not the same as knowing God. And Job repents in dust and ashes and God, being who he is, restores to him everything plus what he had lost. So he lost it, and God blessed him again and gave it back and more. And he then had to pray for his lovely friends. So I came to see that actually it's not an intellectual knowledge. You can study as many books as you like seeking to find out whether this God is, is who the scripture says he is. But it's dependent on divine revelation to each one of us. So going back just briefly also on, on the cross of Jesus, and, and one of the things that struck me as well, was thinking about the people who were there. How must his mother have felt? when she saw her son. I can't imagine. It must have broken her heart. And then we heard, so let's die. It is finished. What is finished? What has finished? Has it finished in your life? Has it finished in mine? I see that as a, as a spiritual, it is finished. The battle has won. He has won it, and for some reason or other, no, it isn't for some reason or other, it's because he loves us. He's given us that victory. So back to the cross, because this, I think, is such an important factor. You mentioned something this morning as well, so it fits in. Sin changes a person's countenance. Somebody who is sodden with alcohol, 
high on drugs, has a horrible life, can't, doesn't enjoy their lives at all. They have a certain countenance. Okay, I thought so. Scripture tells us that Jesus took all the sins of the earth, of everyone, past, present, and future, on himself. Now what must that have done to his appearance? What did he look like? So again, the word of God is very descriptive, and Isaiah particularly, and this was one of, the, one of my favorite parts of Isaiah many years ago when I was still a schoolgirl, like yesterday. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, and suddenly no one wanted to have anything to do with him anymore. They all kind of scattered. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. This Jesus who had been followed and listened to, blessed and healed many, was suddenly despised and rejected. But, Isaiah goes on to say, it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. That blows my mind. He would be the guilt offering, paying the highest price ever, bearing our iniquities, but he would see the light of his life and be satisfied. He bore the sin of many, yours and mine and everybody else's before and all those yet to come, and made intercession for transgressions. Their appearance changed the moment we, you and I, come to accept Christ. Our countenance changes, as you have said. The eyes light up. The smile is broader. I remember my son saying, is he a Christian? And I said, why do you ask, Mark? He said, because he has a happy face. <laughs> he was eight, eight at the time. So from the Old and the New Testament, we see that these endless sacrifices which pointed to Christ could never fulfill and pay for sin. We know that. We've heard it so many times. But only Christ it was a once-off. But when it says it bears the sin of many, and in the past the word all had quite an impersonal feel to it, even though I, I had already become a believer. It was the all, but it had to be me too. But that is what I found, that the all meant me included. So, I'm getting near the end here. We know that life can be tough. I don't think any of us can say that life has been wonderfully easy, because it hasn't. Mine hasn't. But Jesus has done something profound since I came to know him and particularly even more so since I have been looking at this whole aspect of the cross. And then I can see that the sovereignty of Christ made the centrality of the cross impactful because the two are married together. I mean, 
You wouldn't have had the cross without the central, without the supremacy and 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 the um, sovereignty of God. And recently, in the church clip, we saw that the reason why you and I are all here and why we have a reason to be believing, because this is the season to believe, is because the man in the middle of the cross said, I could come. And that's why I'm standing here in front of you. Because the man on the cross said, I could. And I stood back and said, but I'm old. Let the others do it. And God says, no. I've touched you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Go out and embrace and share what I have given you, because that is why you have been called. To be a little bit more theological, what do we see in the cross of Christ? Well, in the centrality of the cross, we have forgiveness. We have a few highlights that are specific. Justification. We've been rescued from this present evil age. We have been redeemed from the curse of the law. We are made righteous by grace. And incidentally, as one of my previous pastors said in, in an anagram, was uh, Ian McKellar, he said, grace is Christ's, God's riches at Christ's expense. So we, the cross means that through the cross we are sanctified And we too are sanctified, crucified with Christ, as Paul said. It is a subject of our witness. Because of the cross, you and I have the, are given the power to witness. It's not my power, but his power in me. And it, as Paul says, it is also the object of our boasting. And the only thing, as Paul says in Galatians, because I've been going through Galatians a lot, is that the only thing that counts is faith, expressing itself through love. But finally, my final little cherry on the top of the cake. I got this from a book I was reading called If the Tomb is Empty, by a gentleman called Toby, Joby Martin. And he talks about a napkin. And apparently, in Jewish culture, when you had a meal, and you, if you had to get up for some reason or other to go to the bathroom, or if, let me put it this way, when you finished your meal, put your napkin, just plonk it on the table. But if you get up and you aim to come back to the table, you fold your napkin, and the folded napkin says, I'm coming back. Now, what did the people find when they went to the tomb where Jesus had been buried. They found his grave clothes folded. 
what does that say? I'm coming back. On that note, I just praise God and thank him for this phenomenal, phenomenal gift that we have. Thank you.